Welcome to Lessons in Leadership, Steve Adubato with my colleague, Mary Gamba. Mary, how are we doing today? I'm doing great, Steve. Thank you so much. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. We're going to kick things off with someone else who always has a very positive attitude. Mike Marin, President and CEO, Holy Name. Good to see you, Mike. Great to be here, Steve. Thank you, Mary. Good to see you. You too. Hey, Mike, let's, let's talk. Um, we've had so many interviews with you about a variety of topics, but let's talk medical professionals and leadership, meaning I've often asked this question. I'm curious about it. Why is it so important to coach and develop leaders, whether it's nursing, nurses, physicians, other medical professionals? Why is that such an important activity to be engaged in on a regular basis? Well, uh, so many reasons. One, despite all the advancements in technology and infrastructure and buildings, uh, this has been and always will be a people to people kind of a business, right? You have to, so leadership is about dealing with, you know, all your staff, your followers, whoever, you know, not just them, but, but the community and being able to take a lead. So uh, healthcare is evolving at a rapid pace. Um, healthcare and, and bodies a lot of different individuals all of those attributes require strong leadership it's not something physicians nurses other clinicians are exposed to in their academic careers they're focusing on the science um and so it really warrants uh, a lot of effort once they are in the workforce to help them cultivate the leadership skills that hopefully in in some is innate and in others needs to be taught Quick follow-up on that. Uh, Holy Name received a $3.8 million federal grant connected to the School of Nursing. Talk about it. Great effort by uh, Congressman Gottheimer. Um, the uh, uh, nursing school here, it's a 100-year-old school. It's been around since 1925. Uh, graduates on average about 100 nurses a year. A great high-performing uh, school. Had traditionally received support from the federal government through the Medicare program. Um, that funding was pulled back a, mm. a couple of years ago, right? Uh, just before COVID, Congressman Gottheimer lobbied heavily and was a strong advocate and, and had the funding that was taken back. Actually, they came in and clawed back money from the hospitals, for all the hospitals that had across the country that had hospital based schools of nursing and now and had that money that was clawed back restored. Okay, jump in, Mary. Yeah, definitely. And Mike, I know we've talked about this a lot, but I feel like so much has changed since the last time that we had you on when it comes to wellness and leadership. Uh, by the time this airs, it'll be about three and a half years post pandemic. And I know there's still a lot of residual, you know, the emotions and everything happening with COVID. What have you found to be one of the keys to really bouncing back that resilience and the wellness with your team in a world really post COVID? Well, so for us, we, you know, every every crisis usually has a silver lining to it. If you sit back and you look for it and you find it, uh, the pandemic, no different. And so here, and especially at Holy Name, an opportunity to really define why we exist in the first place, why we are here, our agility, our ability to respond, our ability to meet the needs of the community that we serve for. Now, post-pandemic, how do you harness that to, to continue to excel in what we do for our community. Um, most people here, we, you know, we talk to them a lot about it. It's not just a job. This is, this is a profession, it's a career. You're here for things that are far more rewarding than just a paycheck. Uh, and if you subscribe to that and you're motivated by that, you're gonna excel here. We tap into that energy um, post pandemic and we've seen some incredible advances occurring across the spectrum in all our service lines as a result. Follow up on that, Mike. You talk about more than a job. The other uh, initiative that's more than a job is Villa Marie Claire, the reopening of it. Put that in perspective because we've done programming in the past on our sister Caucus Educational Corporation programming, um, an important initiative on so many levels. Talk about it, Mike. So Villa Marie Claire is a dedicated 20 bed inpatient hospice located on 27 acres of just absolute pristine grounds in, in Saddle River, New Jersey. Uh, it's a one of a kind facility. Most hospices are linked to either a hospital or a nursing home or an assisted living facility. This is a standalone facility. All they do is end of life. 
And there's a misconception about what end of life is. In New Jersey, uh, we have the um, uh, dubious honor of ranking last in the country when it costs the, when it comes to the cost of health care spent in the last six months of life. And that's as much a function of the medical profession as it is of society at large. The bill is intended to support families, friends, and loved ones of someone who's in those last months and weeks and days of life mm. to live that, that time as to its fullest. And what we believe and what we have seen is just tremendous success. So it is now um, a grand facility. The renovations are just off the charts. And people ask, like, why would you spend so much money here? Why would you make this? This is where people come to die. And they said, no, absolutely wrong. This is where people come to live to the highest and fullest potential the last days of their lives. And what's most important, if we're going to move the needle on this, is those survivors, those family, friends, and, and people who are touched by someone who has passed away to change their mindset because it's a fate none of us can escape. And yet we, with the fear that is around it is so intense that it really intimidates the well-educated physicians right on down to the families and friends. And so we need to, we need to move the needle on that. And the villa has done that. The grounds, the, the building itself, uh, I've harnessed the energy and amplified it there to help the people there cope mm -hmm. with and find hope and find the collateral beauty in, 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 the moments of right before death, which are going to, they exist for all of us. You just have to look for it. Mike, give a shout out to your leader there who we've had on many times. Mm -hmm. Dr. Violati is terrific. Yeah, Dr. Charlie Violati is a, is a living saint. is a radiation oncologist who had many personal tragedies, foregoed his, uh, his professional career to now transition it from a radiation oncologist to a uh, hospice and palliative physician. He lives on the grounds 24-7. He's available to people. Um, one of the most impactful individuals I've ever encountered in my entire life. Talk about a great leader. Mary, last question for Mike. Yeah, definitely, Mike. I want to talk a little bit about empathy. Every time we have you on, you are truly one of the most empathetic, caring human beings, not even just a hospital physician leader that I've ever met. And, and how do you surround yourself with other empathetic people? Because especially in healthcare, empathy and leadership go hand in hand. Yeah. What advice do you have for other organizations out there that are really looking to surround themselves with an empathetic team? And great, great point, Mayor. <laughs> and, I, and I must hide it well, because I wish they were more like it around me, right? They're, they're, and they're there. To me, it's it's one of the lessons I've always, um, I've always taught my four sons, right? You have to have conviction and tolerance in equal measure. So if you're convicted to the idea that being empathetic, to understand your fellow human being, to try to walk in their shoes, not to prejudge, not to pre-assume anything. And, you're, and so you have to have a conviction to behave and conduct yourself every day that way. But you also have to have a high degree of tolerance when those that you do don't respond in a way that you would like, or you see others who don't have necessarily that degree of empathy. And if you mix those two together, then eventually you find that you're surrounded by people who do behave and act and think of others before they think of themselves. That's a great, that's a great trait. It's one of the reasons I'm here for 35 years because this organization is just full of individuals who behave and think and act accordingly. I wish our leaders in Washington would uh, listen to what Mike is saying right now. That's another story. Hey, Mike, uh, we want to thank you for joining us on Lessons in Leadership. We wish you all the best. Thank you, Steve. Mary, thank you. Great to be here as always. Thank you so much. This is Lessons in Leadership. Uh, Mary Gamba, Mike Marin. Be right back after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bicino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Veolia, resourcing the world. Choose New Jersey and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. 
If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIA NJ, and Commerce Magazine, and Meadowlands Chamber, celebrating 50 years of building connections and driving business growth. The essence of the North Ward Center is ingrained in our values, thoughts, and actions. What began as a storefront on Bloomfield Avenue has evolved into a life-changing community nonprofit. The mansion is steeped in tradition, but with all of its grandeur, the true essence of the North Ward Center is in the people we serve. So as the North Ward Center commemorates 50 years of service, let's also celebrate the many opportunities yet to come. We're honored to be joined by Shanae Harris, Vice President Social Responsibility and President of the Prudential Foundation. Good to see you, Shanae. Great to see you, Steve. We will put up the information about Prudential Foundation, one of our longtime supporters of programming, particularly focused on the city of Newark and its citizens and the needs of the citizens of Newark. Prudential Foundation's mission is? Well, our mission is really to provide economic opportunity, particularly for those who have not had that opportunity or have had barriers to creating that opportunity. And it's really centered around our purpose. We believe as a company deeply that financial security should be within reach for everyone. So our philanthropic work really helps to um, allow Prudential to realize that purpose. And you, you grew up in Newark. Yes, yes, Newark native. Yeah, same here. Um, by the way, what neighborhood were you? Born in the North Ward, um, grew up in Balesburg, and my family currently lives in the Central Ward. So I have you, got, you got three of the five wards covered. <laughs> So, Shanae, let me ask you this. To what degree, again, this is a leadership focus, but also very much focused on the impact uh, that you and your colleagues are having in Newark. To what degree for you as a leader in the philanthropic community has growing up in Newark, being a Newark native, influenced and impacted your leadership approach to the work you do for the people of Newark? So, Steve, you, you're a Newark native. You know how protective Norkers are of their city and how much we love the city and particularly um, have been fiercely um, protective of kind of the negative perception that the city has, um, you know, um, garnered over the years. Um, so I grew up in an environment that was very community focused, very nurturing, um, had a lot of um, love and support from community leaders, nonprofit leaders. Um, which I think, you know, is very common in the city of Newark. And I think with that support and nurturing and mentoring, um, there was also this instilling within young people that um, there was a responsibility, right? Um, once they were in the position to do so, to give back to the community. So I think that ethos really carries through in the leadership role that I play at Prudential. But I think it's quite common um, for, for all the civic leaders in the city, this idea that um, when there's a platform and an opportunity that we not only help ourselves, but we also look to make sure that the city continues to strengthen and nurture the next generation. Newark pride is real. Mary, jump in. Yeah, and Shanae, you're talking a lot about relationship building, the importance of convening. How did that play out throughout the pandemic, meaning, Obviously, there were a lot of challenges. What did that look like in terms of the grit, the resilience that it took for everyone to come together and come out of the other side uh, together as a unit? Well, I would say that, you know, the events during the pandemic, starting with 2020, um, probably were some of the most challenging um, events that many leaders had to face. And for us at Prudential, um, we immediately pivoted to making sure our partners were okay. Um, we knew that the pandemic would amplify and really magnify um, issues of inequity that we had addressed um, through our philanthropic strategy for decades. But there was also an opportunity to raise up those issues, to actually um, work in collaboration with others to provide strategies to address those needs. 
So for us, it was really making sure we were supporting organizations where residents were getting services um, that they desperately needed. But we also looked holistically, even internally within Prudential. Um, how do we make sure the small businesses and vendors that depended on us um, were able to stay afloat? How do we make sure that our tenants um, in many of our properties um, were able to still operate? Um, so it, our, our response to the pandemic went well beyond philanthropy. And I'm really proud to say that the company stepped up, really looking at the things that we could do as a corporate anchor institution to support this community and make sure that we all got through this okay. You know, Shanae, I want to follow up on, on this question Mary has asked you. It's a very insightful, complex question, but 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 it, it causes me to want, uh, and I, people are going to notice, uh, we're doing this on Lessons in Leadership. We're also going to try to use this on our public broadcasting platforms as well because the content is relevant. I ask this question a lot as it relates to COVID. The biggest impact on you as a leader in terms of your approach to leadership three plus years into the pandemic, biggest change COVID has made on you as leader is? I think it's made me more empathetic. It's made me more intentional about how you connect with people. I mean, one of the biggest shifts um, that we're still adjusting to um, at Prudential is not being in place every day. Um, we have adopted a role our uh, uh, arrangement where um, we are in the workplace for part of the week, but we're also remote. Um, so being able to stay connected with partners um, when you have employees that may be all over the state, all over the United States, requires a different leadership focus. And I think that you know the pandemic has allowed me to one, slow down, make sure that we're looking at um, our team holistically, really looking at their needs and making sure they have what they need to care for others. Um, and it requires a different approach to stay connected, um, particularly when um, not everyone is centered in place um, right now. Yeah, Mary and I talk a lot about uh, wellness, the wellness leadership connection. And uh, Shanae is all over that right now because wellness is a complex equation. Mary, one more quick question before we yeah, get out of here. And Steve, you and I share a brain. I was just going to ask about wellness, but more so in the connection to grit, because a lot of people think they're opposite side of the coin, that you can't be well if you're also grit and you're hustling all the time. Talk about the importance of grit and resilience throughout the pandemic. Well, I think we had to channel a lot of resilience, um, you know, and many of us didn't know that we had the level of resilience um, um, in us, right, until we were confronted with challenges. I think a couple of things. One, I think to get to resiliency and grit, um, you have to be vulnerable as a leader. Um, there were times when I said, hey, I'm not quite sure how we move forward, um, but we're all going to figure it out uh, because we have to. And that allows folks to lean into um, the problem solving, the creativity, um, and the collective action that is required to, to step forward. And um, vulnerable leadership, authentic leadership, um, acknowledging that this is a learning journey for all of us um, were really important things that we were able to draw on so that we can come up with creative ways, right? Um, to, to meet the needs of, of our constituents um, during this crisis. And as uh, Shanae shares that very honest response, I've often said, I won't get on my soapbox, that being a confident leader does not mean you're not scared, does not mean you're not fearful, does not mean you don't worry about the unknown or the impact of COVID, the economics of it. It means that there's a degree of grit that helps you get through it, even if you are vulnerable. By the way, before I let you go, Shane, do you believe, as I believe, that there is something to be said. Now, Mary grew up in, I think, Fords, New Jersey. I'm still yeah. not sure where that is. Oh, stop. <laughs> I know it's part of the exactly Woodbridge. Exactly where but... Fords is. Thank you, Shanae. <laughs> that is where I grew up, and Steve always bashes it. Everybody's like, it's I'm Woodbridge. Not it's you. not. I it's just... Fords. I just don't know where it is. So here's the thing. <laughs> Shanae, are you with me on this, that there's a level of Newark grit that helps us in particularly tough times? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you think about just how our mayor led, lifting up community voices, um, making sure that, you know, places in the city were accessible to all. 
That's using right. arts and culture as a way to, um, you know, engender hope. Yes, there was a grit and it was a wonderful thing to see how the community came together, how folks made sure that families and children were, were connected. So, there yes. Is, I yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. There is no grit. I, I believe in it. I think I have some of it. shanae has got a lot of it. I'm sure there's Ford's grit. And Mary, share with <laughs> and my dad was other. born and raised in Brooklyn, so he instilled oh, the Brooklyn that grit. That changes everything. And that's why between Ford's and Brooklyn, that's me. <laughs> Mary sounds a little defensive to me right now. But Shana, we're going to let you go. Mary and I will talk after. Shana, thank you so much. And to the team at the Prudential Foundation, thanks, Shana. Thank you again. Take care. Great job. Stay with us. Mary from Ford's will be right back after this. <laughs> Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIA NJ, and Commerce Magazine, and Meadowlands Chamber, celebrating 50 years of building connections and driving business growth. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership, Steve Adubato. I want to thank um, Mike Marin for joining us in this edition of Lessons in Leadership. You know, Mary, real quick on this. I know we're going to talk about uh, one of your favorite books, How to Stop Wearing and Start Living, Dale Carnegie, part of our leadership library that people can look on our website and find. But you know what's interesting? We've had Mike on many times, but it's unless it's me, could be. It's not the same conversation. How, how does that happen? It, it is always, it, you and I are on the air all the time and it's never the same conversation. And I think it's because we surround ourselves with very like-minded people who believe in leadership, who believe in developing their people. And most of all, they care. And that's just very exciting to be able to feature and talk and learn because they are also lifelong learners and they continually have new things to share. Okay, shift gears. So uh, Mary, how did you get introduced to the Dale Carnegie book, uh, how to stop wearing and start living. Yeah. By the so way, some, I, who said who said on our show recently that that was one of their favorite books as well? Well, that's where it started from, actually. So this was on one of our sister series, and it was one of the guests that we had on, and it was a um, somebody in political. It was one of the legislative leaders who had just retired. Oh, it was it was Senator Oraho. Did Steve he just retire? Oraho said, <laughs> Steve Oraho said, who was retiring after many years in the Senate. Yeah. And he's one of the most decent caring people in public life. He said one of his favorite books was How to Stop Wearing and Start Living. Is that where you picked it up? That's 100% where I picked it up because, and the irony was, you and I have both talked about Dale Carnegie for years, right? And I've heard about the book. Win friends and influence. Yeah. No, that's yeah. Not <laughs> but, but I do judge a book by its cover and the cover is horrific. I mean, I know that the book was written like 100 years ago, but the cover should not look like it was written 100 years ago. But it's not about the cover. When I tell you that this book was life-changing, certain things come into your life at a certain time. And I often get into that spiral thinking. If I if I don't have something to worry about, I worry about what the next thing is going to be that I'm going to worry about. And I said, I need this book, right? And my husband is always like, why do you always have to have something to worry about, even if there's nothing to worry about? I'm almost better off when there's something big happening, because then that has my focus, Right. And that's one of the themes in this book is that if you're busy, busyness, right? You can't be focused on other things. And that's one of the keys to business. And they play, they do play on that word. And if your mind is busy, if you're doing things, you don't have enough room to be worried. And that's just one of so many useful tips that are so helpful when every day there's ups and downs, left, right, both personal and family and work and life in general. Okay. So let's put up, let's create a mini yep. lessons and leadership seminar. Um, and the title, let's come up with this, Stop Wearing and Start Living. We'll, we'll adapt that from Dale Carnegie's book. <laughs> that has a really good ring to it, but yes. Okay. So the first one is focus on today. Why can't I be obsessed about tomorrow, the next day, the next day? What do you mean focus on today? Yeah. And one of the biggest things he talks about in the book is you can't worry about things that already happened. They've happened. You can't go backwards. On the flip side, you also cannot worry about what's going to happen, even you know tomorrow or what a week from happen. now. It, or, yeah, you can't worry happen. about what could happen. Sure, you know you're going to get the people, the naysayers. Well, you have to plan. Of course, you have to plan. We're not saying that you're just going to live, you know, all willy nilly and just do whatever. But what you are going to do is be present, be in the moment, and focus on just this exact second. That's all we have. Second bullet: understand the situation. 
Yeah, that's a really big one. Oftentimes, if you don't get the details of a situation, you worry about things that either aren't true, that are, you know, inflated because in your spiral thinking, you think something is bigger than it is. So it's really getting all the facts, getting all the details rather than living in some artificial, you know, scenario. You know, uh, before we go to the third bullet, <clears throat> Mary has used the term spiral thinking several times. Mary, the other book that changed my life mm -hmm. that you and I talked about over 20 years ago oh, yeah. when we first met, who is the author of yeah. the book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, that has a great chapter called Beware of Spiral. Spiral Thinking. And that would be Richard Carlson. And I have to say, if it weren't for <clears throat> Richard Carlson, you and I may never have ended up working together. Because when I met, you happen to have that book and that sparked the conversation and the rest was history. That's actually true. Mary was a patient rep at a hospital and or patient advocate. Or, we've told the story a million times and I was on a VIP list and she goes, I don't even know who you are and I don't even care. I didn't and know who you are, I'm sorry. You still don't know who I am. <laughs> um, but then we started, she saw that book and we started a conversation, conversation. You said this before, Mary, bullet number three. Use busyness as a distraction. Yep, and I didn't advocate. even, I knew it was on here, but that's why it was in my head too. But yes, be busy. But hold on well, you... one second, Mary. Isn't that distracting us from what we need to be worried about? It's not being, it's just not being foolishly busy. It's about being productive, doing something that actually is either bringing you joy, bringing you a feeling of accomplishment, whether it's, you know, working on the garden, you can't do two things at the same, you can't think about two things at the same time. If you try to think about what you had for breakfast and think about your favorite number at the same time, they happen both in succession, but they do not happen at the same exact time. So while you're talking about being busy in a productive way, you don't mean going down the rabbit hole of Instagram or Facebook. It, and it, looking that at... brings you joy. Right now, my Instagram is filled with dog videos and dogs doing, dogs falling into a pool, dogs hopping up and down. If it's something that, I know. But if it's something that brings you joy, sure. If it's Facebook and you're watching it, whose kids accomplish what, and you're feeling, hey, my kids aren't that great. They didn't accomplish that. Then don't do it. That's not the type of business that we're talking about. Hey, do you ever notice on Facebook, we all, and I do the same thing. It was our anniversary the other day. It was Mary's anniversary with Bill a few days before. I'm always putting really great things about our family. I notice when there's a family argument or fight, I never put that on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you so should start. That, that would go viral. Oh, that'd be big. Uh, next bullet. Don't sweat the small stuff. Or the improbable? Yep, exactly. So you don't want to worry about, and you and I have talked about this years ago when you're like, well, what if every single, you know, on our nonprofit television production side, what if every single underwriter doesn't come on board? What are we going to do? <laughs> That's pretty improbable, right? You're going to have, you know, you're going to lose clients, you know, a client, a really great partner is going to retire. You're going to lose a great team member, but you can't worry about the things that are totally ridiculously absurd. And finally, accept the situation. Can yeah. I fight it? Oh my I, gosh, accept it. Once you accept it, then your mind will immediately shift to what can I do about it? And sometimes the answer may be nothing. And he talks about in the, that in the book as well. If the answer is nothing, there's absolutely nothing that can be done about this situation. You got to let it go. You know, I need to stop worrying that Mary's going to leave me one day to start her dog rescue. <laughs> and then I won't have my right and my left arm, my partner. Oh, you know, you I'm don't have to worry worried. about that anymore. We're we're in this together. We're going to ride into the sunset yeah. together. I don't know what she's talking about the sunset, but I I'm not going to stop worrying. That's it. Mary, do what you have to do and I'll do what I have to do. If it works out fine, I've just stopped worrying. That's it. I'm done. That's it. No worries. And I'm also not worried because I know we ran out of time. See you next time. Lessons in Leadership. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University. Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Veolia, resourcing the world, Choose New Jersey, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine, and Meadowlands Chamber, celebrating 50 years of building connections and driving business growth.